वेलकम टू तेलुगु नारा रेडियो फेसबुक वेब लाइव ऑन यू एस इमिग्रेशन वी आर डूइंग एवरी वेडनेसडे सेंट्रल टाइम 6 पीएम ऑन तेलुगु नारा रेडियो फेसबुक लाइव विद फेमस अटॉर्नी लुकस गैरिस्टन फ्रॉम बर्गोस एंड गैरिस्टन लॉ फर्म सो दिस प्लेटफॉर्म ब्रिंग टू गिव द मोर इंफॉर्मेशन ऑन यू एस इमिग्रेशन टू कम्युनिटी uh is like we are trying to give the accurate information of us immigration system maybe you can connect to the telugu nara radio facebook page and you can post your questions and get more information if you have any any queries or any complex um, the question maybe you can send a email to info at uh, bgimmlaw.com lucas will ready to reply instantly So don't panic and get connect to Telugu Nadu Radio Facebook Live and get more USA immigration information. This week we are bringing a lot of information. We will connect with uh, Lucas and uh, get more information this week. Lucas, welcome to Telugu Nadu Radio Facebook Live. Welcome to show. Thank How you. How are you? Cat. Doing well. Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Good. I was. Uh, How was the Thanksgiving? Uh, Thanksgiving was great. You know, we had to uh, socially distance and kind of keep it smaller than we wanted. But uh, overall, it was a great time uh, spent with family. So, how how was your Thanksgiving? Yeah, it wonderful. So next group, next group, next two weeks, uh, the Christmas Eve. I think you were already plan. You were trading. So we'll. Events, very interesting events. Eagerly waiting for the Christmas Eve. Right. What be, what about you? Nice, nice holiday. You know, uh, hopefully be able to take some time off and uh, uh, relax and enjoy time with family. So uh, good yeah. news uh, yeah. all around. You know, we hear the vaccines coming out. So hopefully, you know, things do get somewhat back to normal here in the next few months. So. Other than that, yeah, yeah. there is a, there is a good thing actually. Vaccine is out, but uh, the first thing first they are giving to the frontliners, nurses and uh, st- medical staff. Eventually, they distribute it to all uh, all U.S. citizens. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Lucas. Uh, then yeah, we we can go for the. Uh, immigration information before going to the further you can share if if you if anything on recent changes on immigration well i think uh something that most viewers are going to want to hear that we've been uh following up and discussing for the past couple of weeks was the uh, uh hr 1044 house resolution that went through to the senate and then the senate then uh returned the uh is in um S386 uh, uh you know back to the house which you know right now is uh you know kind of impacting um uh what's going on uh, um in regards to being passed in the in the session i know we spoke last week there's kind of a lame duck session that's happening now but there is you know a, a key measure pushing forward to get a spending bill passed to keep the government open now this uh S386 uh, could uh come back in as an uh, amendment to the spending bill but you know really i think a lot of people uh, haven't been fully educated as far as what has happened to S386 uh when it was returned back to the house for approval and there's uh, quite a few points that are really disturbing that would negatively impact uh i think uh you know a lot of different people specifically those who are in H1B status who are from India and China uh and i just want to go over a few notes that i have here about why this version uh is not a very good version uh at all uh so you know recapping what we just said i think um it, what this would say is they would want to cap the number of h1b non-immigrants who can adjust their status to permanent residence annually which uh disproportionately impacts both indian and chinese nationals so 
as much as it, uh, great news as it would be to have uh, no country lim- uh, cap limits on, on uh, you know, the EB uh, categories uh, to get rid of the backlog, there would still be uh, an asterisk, so to speak, uh, where if you are an H-1B status and you're looking to, uh, you know, utilize this to get your GC, then you're obviously going to be impacted because you're going to go right back into a whole nother backlog. So you're getting rid of one backlog and going to another. That's first. Uh, second, uh, there's only limited protection. So many people who are waiting and have been waiting uh, on this backlog for many years are going to have issues where their kids are getting older. So, you know, if your kid is approaching the age of maturity here, the, there's only so much time you, you have before you file. And there's a law that we have called the Child Status Protection Act that will help uh, protect kids from aging out. Now, this uh, current bill wouldn't allow you to uh, apply early enough to protect your children from aging out. Uh, so that's also key, especially as we get close to, you know, the high school age, about to go to college. You know, if something happens and you don't get the GC by that time, then now, you know, your kid's going to have to go on and change status probably to F1. Um, and then it's going to delay their ability to get uh, uh, their GC for many years. Uh, that's another key uh, issue that's not in this new Senate bill. Um, third and most important uh, point that I pulled out of the, you know, the, the changes that were made is there's additional key restrictions on the H-1B visa program. Now, we all know how tumultuous the past four years have been in regards to the H-1B regulations, uh, changes, and things like this, Uh, employer-employee relationship, third-party offsite employment, uh, most recently the IFR, where we've discussed the past few weeks in regards to wage level changes, uh, proposed changes also for limiting the duration to one year. Uh, Fortunately, all that is now, um, you know, suspended and it's not gonna be implemented. But uh, if this passed, then this would allow that to, you know, we would lose ground that we just fought so hard for uh, up to this point. So um, really, uh, you know, like we've discussed and uh, been optimistic, I really believe this next year uh, we have a very good chance for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, We have two uh, key Senate runoff races that are both in Georgia. Uh, for January 5th. And if uh, those two seats go to Democrats, then the Democrats would have control of uh, the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And it would make it much easier for us to get this comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, And we discussed many times over the past few weeks, I think the most uh, basic reform we could get was, you know, Congress can issue however many visas uh, that they deem necessary at any fiscal year. So at the minimum, uh, we could have it where we, you know, Congress could say anyone who has uh, had a pending I-140 for two years or three years, whatever it might be, without a visa available, um, that anyone that meets that criteria can go ahead and file for adjustment status and that the visa would be available. So there's, there's a lot of many things that could happen. There's a lot of potential for changes. There's probably better options than this uh 1044 bill and also 386 that most people have been discussing. This, Lucas, you are saying is 10044 and S386 bill is benefiting for the per country limit removal, but uh, at the same time, it's difficult to get the first time H1B, right? Well, not so much first one H1B. I think what you want to look at is what restrictions might be included on something. So, you know, most uh, politicians are lawyers, and as lawyers, we all uh, are very technical and and, uh, I guess you could say tricky as far as like what they want to do. So some politicians, Republicans, uh, might see this as an opportunity to say, okay, I will give you this, but in doing so, I'm going to take away this, right? So that's kind of the crossroads we're at. I, I really don't see much traction or any hope where 
you know, the with all the other pressing matters that are uh, before the Congress right now to get a bill done to keep the government open I, and the CARES Act and everything else that's going on at the moment, I just really don't see uh, as important as this is, is probably not the same level of importance as uh, other, you know, bills that are having to be considered in spending packages and so on and so forth. No. <clears throat> So where we are this um, the bill in house and how is it? I think a house will open for next two days after the Christmas holidays. Do you think this bill will pass in house? Uh, so like what we were discussing a minute ago, I, I think what we have to dis to realize is that, um, you know, the Senate uh, majority leader, Mitch McConnell and uh, the the Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, are the ones that are working on multiple, you know, bills that need to go through. OK, so the most important bill right now, there's a spending bill, appropriations bill to keep government open for the next month. OK, um, we don't want the government to shut down. That would be uh, compiling a, a problem um, on top of the current pandemic, and it would be crippling to our economy and and support services that we we rely on and need that's number one number two we have a cares act um bill that's you know they're trying to fi do the final negotiations for right now uh to hopefully get you know pass any impasses um and get that passed so we can get relief to every uh, american workers okay uh, so those are the two main headliners uh, mixed in with these there's probably numerous other bills that are sitting there and you know we would just have to see uh you know what makes sense uh to move forward and whenever you have such drastic changes from one original bill and sent back as a different you know bill more or less uh you you know something like that you, you have all these negotiations and you'd have to work on that and uh, have discussions and have some sort of agreement or compromise. And I, I just don't know if there's enough time or enough uh, room for that to happen at the moment. Okay. So what is the last day session working this year? The 18th? I December believe 18th? It's the, well, it's the 18th, but I believe they're going to have to extend that. And, you know, they can, they can extend uh, if they need to. But, you know, I think the 18th, the 18th of this month is the target that everyone's working for to get get something done. Uh, so, you know, we'll have to wait and see. I think today is 16th, so that would be this Friday, correct? Yes, yeah. this Friday. Okay. I think uh, we will closely monitor this 386 bill update and uh, we'll keep update, keep posting updates in Facebook wall. You can follow the Telvinara Radio and uh, Burgos and Garrison Love Facebook. You can get more information about uh, S386 bill. Hopefully, we will see it means uh, we'll, we, we, everyone is anticipating go for positive, but we don't know what will happen in Senate and House. So because of two different version, the House and uh, Senate, the someone will compromise this um, the version, then it will go faster as for my understanding. So hopefully we'll see the and get positive information, positive way from house. Lucas, uh, in, I'm stepping back to October visa bulletin. Most of the H1 holders apply for adjustment of status in October. Who downgraded the EB, EB2 to EB3 as of now, we don't see any receipt. Do you know uh, any update? Do you have any update on this one? When they will get the receipts and uh, biometrics? Very good uh, question. So actually, uh, today I followed up again with uh, AILA, which is uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association. We have daily updates. Uh, we have liaison committees that reach out to various government entities, one of which USCIS, uh, to see, you know, with the lockbox, how they're processing. So we have a few uh, different events occurring all at one time. So we have, we're experiencing huge delays, um, you know, with anything to do with the lockbox. Now, 
if you downgraded your uh, I-140 and you filed concurrently, uh, all those petitions go to one lockbox here in Texas. And uh, on top of just being at one lockbox and limited resources uh, there, you know, there's other various other cases that are filed, not just people from EB2, EB3 from India. You, you know, there could be a various other people from other parts of the world, different visa categories. And uh, whenever everything's con- filed concurrently, it goes through this lockbox. Now, uh, on top of everything else, in, you know, where USCIS might re- be receiving uh, extra 20, 25,000 applications at one time, uh, we also would note that the officers, there's a lot of officers working remotely. Okay. So there's a, a lot of delay in everything processing. Now, normally, we would say that the processing times are four to six weeks. Uh, we've been saying, you know, since I spoke to all my clients and, and we really try and give the expectation of six to eight weeks, uh, I think we're getting close to that threshold and hopefully we start seeing more um, uh, receipts coming in. But we are aware of the, of the delays. And, uh, you know, like I said, Aila is, you know, from feedback from all the immigration attorneys is, is really on top of it. And we're staying up, up to make sure if there is any uh, delay outside the ordinary processing of what we know of now that we're notified immediately so we can inform our clients. Okay. So I think uh, uh, whoever applied this, uh, in, in um, AB2, it meant it means it did not downgrade it uh, for apply the adjustment status, I think they got the receipt number and uh, they got the biometric. Correct. I think only delay for the downgraded. Correct. So for when you're filing, uh, which would be filing with the supplement J, uh, and you're not downgrading or, or you know refiling a, an I-140 petition, uh, that goes to potentially two different service centers and two different lock boxes in those service centers. So. You know, the work is segmented and divided up, uh, you know, accordingly. And it just so happens right now with just the sheer volume of people downgrading from EB2 to EB3, there's, there is, you know, huge uh, processing delays. And I know we all want the receipts to come quickly and it would be nice to have, but we don't want uh, the work to be sped up where mistakes are made or, some, you know, something happens uh, to give, you know, a bigger headache. So, it, it, you know, patience is everything with this and everyone should be uh, assured that, you know, not just the one attorney that handled the case, but there's many attorneys uh, from our, our group that are monitoring the situation. And, you know, we're trying to make sure USCIS uh, is informing us if there is any other issues that come up. Okay. Uh, Lucas, uh, we got a uh, question from uh, YouTube, Amol Deshpande, just uh, just uh, is asking, is it difficult to get the functional manager under EB1C approved for the functional manager job abroad in, in, in the United States? Yes, yeah, so e- EB1C would be, you know, uh, a category for a manager and executive uh, you know, from abroad, you have to work abroad three, uh, one out of the previous three years. Uh, and when you come here, if you're here on an L1 uh, A visa, you can apply. You don't have to be here on an L1 to apply for the EB1C. But the process is pretty similar. Um, you know, we have to show similar ownership between the two entities. We have to show the need, the, you know, the, the people, the underneath uh, the manager's position that would support the position. Um, so there's a lot of different factors involved. It's very much uh, uh, evidence-driven uh, type of case, but, um, you know, it's a similar process what we did with the EB2, EB3s, uh, uh, as far as, like, filing I-140s and things like that. Um, was, there, was there any other additional question about the process or... Okay. Uh, Amul, I think you got the information. If still you want more information, you can send email to Lucas info at the rate bgimmlaw.com. Maybe 
if any if any complex question maybe you can send an email and get more information from lucas thank you amol for your question i'm requesting if you have any questions maybe if any topic you can post in youtube or facebook live page we can address your questions so lucas uh, last week we discussed about um, Trump administration will bring new uh, rules on H1B. Can you share if you have any additional information on that one? Well, uh, we kind of touched base a little bit earlier in the show, and we spoke you know, uh, last week and the week before pretty well in depth about this. So the Trump administration uh, produced uh, an interim final rule, and this is what we've been referring to as the IFR. Uh, so under IFR, there were two uh, agencies that were implementing a rule. We had Department of Labor, and we also had Department of Homeland Security, which incorporates uh, USCIS. Uh, under the DOL rule with IFR, there was uh, sorry, there was uh, uh, the wage level increase. Okay, and. Uh, from there, uh, you know, U.S. court has blocked um, uh, the wage level increase. And, uh, you know, basically now there was another uh, yesterday a, a memorandum by a court, an order stating that, you know, DOL has to go back now and, um, you know, uh, readjust the wage levels to what they would have been for any uh, LCAs or prevailing wages uh, that were filed and, and certified during that time with the higher wage levels. Uh, that was one. The other one was the uh, a, the DH uh, uh, the D DHS uh, provision with USCIS, which would limit uh, H-1B approvals potentially for a one year at a time. It would re uh, incorporate the employer employee relationship, and it would also reincorporate the third party offsite employment uh, availability of specialty uh, uh, specialty occupation. Are, you know, like what we've seen with these RFEs for the past uh, year, year and a half. Uh, and hence, that means uh, you'd have to get all the client letters, you have to get all the contracts, work product, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, good news is at the moment, the implementation of these rules has been suspended. Now, the administration can still go through the rules uh, making, pro the rulemaking process for these rules um and do everything legally but the problem is is there's not i don't think there's enough time for the notice and comment period to happen and for the um government to review all the comments before a new administration's uh in office so if the if this is still ongoing by the time the new administration's in office the new administration can just pull the plug on this uh, before it be becomes a final rule uh, and that's that's what everything's trending towards at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas. Hi, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, you can post in Facebook and uh, Facebook or YouTube. We will address the, your question, or else I can I, I can ask the very general question on immigration H one B green card and. Uh, 485. Because I have uh, uh, most of the most of the events, I have categorized. I have a lot of questions on um, immigration. Mm -hmm. The first is uh, the Biden nominated Alexandro Mayorkas as Secretary of the United States of Department of Homeland Security. So, do you events? He's the he's. He, he is confirmed or about to conform as a secretary of U.S. DHS. So the way it works is the president, and of course there can't be any formal nomination until the president uh, is sworn in. So as soon as the president is sworn in, uh, he's officially president of the United States, he can nominate his cabinet. Now, when he nominates the cabinet, the cabinet still has to be, uh, you know, confirmed to be an official, uh, 
you know, recognized in that position, they have to be confirmed by the Senate. So, uh, you know, all the in, the in years past, this would be done within a month or two. Um, but here recently uh, is, is, you know, things have become more uh, partisan in Washington, D.C., where people challenge every little detail. You know, some of the, these uh, nominations drag on for quite some time. Um, and it doesn't mean that the person nominated cannot act in a certain capacity. Uh, and that's why we see acting secretary um, or acting attorney general, but they still don't have the full authorization to make certain policy rules or changes, uh, you know, uh, you know, at that time. So to give you an example, uh, this, uh, I think his name's Chad Wolf is acting, uh, secretary of, uh, uh, USCIS or DHS, one of the two, he, a uh, court ordered them, uh, USCIS to go ahead and accept, uh, DACA, uh, you know, cases again. And, and, you know, they issued, a, a, a their own rules where if they do accept and they're accepting under these conditions and a lawsuit was, uh, you know, made challenging that, you know, the way that they've gone about re-implementing this. And the judge pretty much said, look, you're as an acting director, you're not able to fully incorporate policy or rules or a- any type of uh, changes. So uh, even though the person that you've discussed would be nominated and be an acting director, they can't, you know, function in the full capacity until the Senate confirms them. So, you know, there, there is I don't foresee this only comes up if you're someone like Donald Trump who wants to issue their agenda. Uh, and by, by when I say agenda, what I mean is make drastic changes to a system uh, that impacts a lot of people in a negative way. Um, you know, that then there's going to be a lot of issues where there's going to be a lot of challenges. If, if a new administration comes in, and they're trying to help people rather than hurt people, or they're trying to help fix a system rather than break a system, there's probably less uh, bumps along the road. And it being, uh, you know, acting versus fully, you know, uh, confirmed directors, probably not as big of a deal as what it would be under, you know, the current administration. Okay. So I think um, Alexandro Mayorkas worked in... uh, Obama administration director of uh, USCIS. Correct. So I think he's majorly involved in H4 uh, implementation, H4 EAD implementation, and other rules. If he confirmed as a secretary of uh, DHS, what do you think uh, implement implement immigration will be liberal or going to be implemented new rules on H4 and maybe any implement uh, immigration system? Well, I think what you want to do is you want to have someone, either liberal or conservative, you want to have someone who knows how the agency works. So we want to know what practical changes can be made and how that's going to impact. And I'll give you an example of that. So uh, two years ago, you know, when we filed for H-4, um, you know, this administration had the bright idea to say, you know, let's do biometrics, you know, uh, let's make sure that there's not a lot of these, you know, criminal masterminds breaking the law that are in H4 status, you know. And, and so what ended up happening is uh, you had a process where people could expect to have an approval within a couple of months or if they filed premium processing with the principal H1 uh, uh, immigrant then, or visa holder, then, you know, you could get a result within a couple of weeks most of the time. And by implementing this new biometrics requirement, it separates the petitions and the, well, the application from the petition. And what it does is now we're seeing H4s uh, taking five, six, seven months to fully be processed. And, and that's not, um, you know, sound policy, no matter, you know, what side of the fence you're on. You want things to run smooth. You want it to be efficient. And uh, you don't want to make changes just because you want to make a change if that makes any sense. So the more you're in, in, involved with the, the agency, the more you know what's the problems, how to fix them, how to th- keep things running smooth. Yeah, hopefully this biometric, H4 biometrics um, came in Trump administration. 
hopefully in Biden administration will remove this biometric for the H4. Amen. So literally it is a long waiting process for H4 and H4 EADs. The most of the uh, H4 EAD holders are affecting for their employment. I'm seeing a lot of cases, even they did not get any, uh, they get the receipt, but they did not get the biometric uh, date and uh, it's not processing till March and uh, May, June. Even who applied in March and April, they still are pending. Right. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, it means the system is getting the complication on the H4 process. Uh, is H4 is nothing, but if you think uh, H4 is nothing, but uh, it getting complicated to get approval on H approval H4, H4 and H4 EAD. Right. Well, here, here's something else. I mean, if you're dragging this out to where it's almost one year, for an approval and let, forget the EAD part. Let's just talk about H4. Well, what if there's an emergency after four or five months and you need to travel home? Well, now you'll still be in status if you have a, uh, a pending um, application, but you're, you know, once you leave, your, your application is deemed abandoned and it's going to be denied. Then you have to go, you have, you know, it, it's a, it's a large, it's a, it's almost like it's a waste of money at that point because you're not really getting uh, what you paid for. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're, it's a lot of money to get these H4s and H4 EADs. And, uh, you know, it, it puts a lot of burden and pressure on people uh, if they have to make decisions about travel or something else. Yeah, you brought a good point, actually. So, yeah, if any applicant uh, application is pending, they should not travel outside of United States. Right. Correct. So as soon as you depart the United States um, and you have an I, uh, your H4 extension pending, uh, the, the application is going to automatically be uh, denied because it's deemed abandoned where you, you've left. Uh, and, and of course, you know, logically thinking, you know, as soon as you leave, if you're going to get it. Um, a new I-94 with a new duration when you come back in. So the extension at that point is, is not needed. Uh, but, but the issue is, you know, you, there, there's a lot of things that might go along with that. So what if you also have a EAD uh, pending, you know, and maybe the, you get the EAD, but the dates aren't the same, or maybe you, there's, there's a lot of issues that cause mismatches, which cause other issues in the future where maybe, uh, Someone who, who's the principal H-1B visa holder sees I have an approval till 2023, but the H-4 somehow doesn't match that in the future. So, that, you know, there's a lot of things that do come up in, in these scenarios. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say one scenario, as for your discussion, just uh, I got one question on my mind. So we'll take one scenario. So H4 is uh, is a pending. The H4 applicant travel outside of United you know, States as emergency. The after a couple of weeks, the H4 approval and at the same time they they got approved the EAD H4 EAD. So once they travel back to the United States, so they will get the new I-94. So will they work on H4 EAD, or they need to apply fresh H4 EAD? Well, so technically, I can imagine it would happen maybe in a certain circumstance, but you, as soon as you depart, they're both going to be, you know, denied. So um, yeah, okay. there's, you know, and that, again, like with all the fees and everything and, and time wasted, uh, it's a huge amount of money, especially, you know, by the, the filing fees take up quite a bit. Uh, you know, we're talking about almost a thousand dollars, and then at the end of the day, if there's an emergency because you have to wait for so long, you're forfeiting like you know a thousand dollars and all the lost time that you might not be able to work. Okay, okay, it means so when they travel to United States, when they left to the United States, automatically deny the application. You mean to say, all right, right, okay. Lucas, just uh, we are discussing about the new secretary of DHS. Here, just I want to understand 
The DHS and USCIS is same agency, one single agency or two different agencies? So Department of Homeland Security uh, encompasses, you know, oh, sub-agencies, so to speak. So you have USCIS, Customs and Border Patrol, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these agencies, you know, have their own purpose. Uh, you know, ICE is involved uh, under this umbrella. Okay. So okay. the main, you know, secretary for DHS would, you know, you know, want to make sure and coordinate with all the other sub agencies within there, right? Okay. Okay. So, yeah. I have some uh, questions on H1. We got one question in uh, the Facebook, uh, YouTube, the Venkar Chituri. Will there, will there be any complications when H4 aged out apply for F1 adjustment of status while is I-485 adjustment status is still pending? Is there any issue if a H4... <clears throat> Is uh, let me, let, yeah, events. I think um, the primary H1 applicant apply the adjustment of status and also dependents. So if if dependent child, the aging maybe 18 years or 17 years or 18 years, limitation is 18 years, right? Correct. Okay. So if uh, dependent child apply the 485 adjustment status the still is pending so we know that is currently we file we applied in filing file filing date not final action date it means that the right. date date will not be locked so the aging out the child they apply the f1 is asking is there any complication this process there's a potential complication where, uh, you know, I, so when you file for adjustment of status, that's what we would say is uh, immigrant intent. Uh, F1 visa technically is a non-immigrant visa uh, where you, once you finish whatever you're going to do, studying, you, you say, I'm going to go to and return home. Um, so there could be some complications with that, but you have to remember, if you file for um, a kid, but the final action date is still years away, you're really, you know, th there's not much benefit to that, depending on how old the kid is. Now, when we first started the show today, we were discussing the Child Protection Status Act and things like this. Now, under the Child Protection Status Act, uh, there's protections there for kids who might age out, and it allows you to you know, kind of uh, go beyond the limit because there was delays in processing of the application uh, or a certain time exists or certain circumstances were there to cause the delay. Um, in doing so, you can recapture the time, just like how we say we recapture maybe time for H-1Bs uh, because of travel or other things. Uh, so in that cir circumstance, that would be possible. But if you're you know, EB2 and you downgrade to EB3 because your priority day is 2013, you know, the final action dates um, are still 2009 for EB2 and 2010 for EB3. And that's going to cause, uh, you know, still multiple years before under the current system before something like that happens. So the best case scenario would be uh, if you have a story like that, and I would imagine whoever submitted the question, if that, if that's your scenario, the best thing to do is, you know, here in a few months, if there's any traction with a comprehensive immigration reform, reach out to your representative, uh, reach out to the Senator, let them know the story, let them know the importance, because if, if the kid misses that opportunity and then has to ch change status to F1, that's going to, you know, cause huge delays. And, um, you know, you can sponsor your kids still, uh, as a legal permanent resident, once you have that uh, de designation, but you know there are limitations whether or not your kid can be married. You see, so if your kid gets married after you petition for them uh, and you're still a legal permanent resident, that puts them in a whole nother category, and that might delay them another two or three years. 
So uh, it, it does have complications to it. That's why, you know, I, I really feel like this next uh, few months, this next uh, administration's really going to uh, have some plan where people can really plan uh, their lives and not, you know, just rely on the current status quo where their visa might be available in 50 years. Yeah, this is uh, some burning points. The who, the whoever the child is turning out to the 17 years is holding out the 17 years or 18 oh, years. I mean, so they will leave the separate branch, actually. They will go to the separate process. Uh, the little bit um, uh, impact the kid. So hopefully the Biden administration will bring the comprehensive immigration system. And uh, you keep saying this, Biden will 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 do some comprehensive, comprehensive immigration system. So hopefully we will get um, implemented. It will implement it within 100 days or maybe uh, within a couple of months. Uh, hopefully it will uh, get benefited to all who will apply the 45 adjustment status. The kids will be saved and get pursued whatever the uh, dreams or maybe the desired things or else it will get some disturbance uh, uh, the, it, it, it will get the, some disturbance as for the studies and uh, their uh, career path you know and that's part of uh, as a personal note that's part of why i uh, was interested in this field is i grew up uh, you know here in dallas and uh, I, I grew up with kids who were, you know, immigrants from different, you know, countries. And it, as you're growing up uh, around, among your friends, among your peers, the, the last thing you would ever want or, or think about is that you might have a certain opportunity uh, that you have a trajectory in your life. I want to go to this school or I'm going to do this and you make plans and then, you know, someone else uh, is not able to make those plans. And that's what you know, it's always touched me and me in and a lot of the things that I, I think about. Uh, and, you know, hopefully uh, other people can also be aware of these hardships. And, and we want to make sure we don't have hardships because the, the worst thing that can happen is someone uh, who can contribute to society or, or make an impact in this world if is limited in some way. And we don't we don't want that. Yes, true. So, Lucas, as you said, is um it means we we requesting requesting you all you can reach out to your local representative congressmen and uh, the senate senators explain your scenarios and uh, uh, maybe push to the Biden administration get comprehensive immigration system so that the kids will get benefit uh, for their future future so contact your local representative and congressman. Explain your scenario. Maybe they will understand and they uh, they will uh, push to the maybe House or Senate uh, is right direction. Maybe positive way for the green card system. Yeah, Lucas, uh, I have on I have some questions on H one B. Yeah, one question is, uh, Lucas, let's say H1, H1, H1 holder is getting to the extension for extension is expiring, but he want to extension. It means this is uh, I'm not sure, but this question is right or wrong, but just uh, I have I have in my mind. I want to clarify this question. Some reason he doesn't have the W2. Uh, is not matched to the LCA. Uh -huh. So, what is the consequences to apply to apply for extension? Well, not so much an extension. Anytime you file a new I one twenty nine petition, this is very critical, uh, and this is also you know part of what uh, the benefit of having an attorney uh, handling the case. We always want to make sure that the previously approved. I-129, uh, you know, H-1B petition, that LCA that was used matches what payroll documents you currently have, okay? Because, you know, sometimes there's an administrative error, things occur 
where where the records aren't updated. But if you submit uh, an H one B case where the LCA uh, doesn't match the the payroll, it's going to cause a, a question immediately. You know, addressed in RFE for the the current amendment or extension, saying you know why. Uh, it, uh, are you working from location A when the LCA is at location B and there's more than uh, normal commuting distance involved, more, let's say more than 50 miles uh, uh, apart? You know, usually this comes up where someone's in a completely different state. So when something like this happens, really, unless there's a, a valid reason that we can introduce saying, you know, there was a huge mistake that was made or the package was sent to USCIS, but we never received a receipt notice or if there, there was something like that, um, you know, we could overcome that. Usually, uh, I would say what would the, normally happen is USCIS can still approve the case, but they'll uh, revoke the I-94, which means the H-1B employee will no longer be able to work and they would need to depart the country or, um, you know, they, and, and that limits you also. So even if you have a, an employer and let's say the employer made the mistake and and you say hey you know i just i'm gonna leave i'm gonna go work for someone else well at that point uh without the the i-94 being active you can't transfer um to a different employer so you really are uh stuck and that's why we want to always treat these uh, i-94s like if they're made out of gold we want to always uh, protect them make sure everything is uh, done correctly with the LCAs, with the petition filings, so we don't have that issue. Okay. So we meant to say the always it should match the LCA and uh, W2 while extending H1B and transfer the H1B. Correct. Both, both purpose, right? Correct. Okay. Lucas, uh, I have questions on green card. Uh, I-140. So it means we know the AC-21, once the I approve the I-140 after 180 days, the employer will not able to revoke. Is true or? Correct. So once you have uh, an I-140, um, the, for six months, the, the petitioner can't just revoke the the I-140. So you're able to you know port that and keep your priority date uh, with another employer. Now, here's something that that um, has changed here recently. Maybe within the past six weeks, uh, there's the uh, adjudicator field manual. The, uh, what the officers go by in determining what does it mean for a same or similar job to be, you know, from one employer to the other. You know, that that type of analysis that's been enhanced uh, to where now a petitioner needs to show a little bit more detail. Uh, to show that the jobs are similar or the same. So just saying like, uh, for example, a software developer versus software developer is the same thing. Uh, maybe now we need to show, and it's always best practice to do this, to show like, well, I have Java experience here and we need to make sure this other job matches with the same environment, so to speak. Uh, so we can show that they, they bridge and they're connected and uh, are same or similar in that, in that regards. But in same similar, um, the H one B holder pursue the new role is a senior programmer or maybe lead of the programmer or project manager. Can we? Oh, can, well, you have can to. He, you have to remember. So what you're doing under H one B is not necessarily what you're uh, looking at for an I one forty. So I one forty is for proffered future employment. Like a, you know, you have your job offer. Once you get your green card. This is the job you're going to perform. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, you know if you if you have like a senior Oracle database manager or something like this, uh, that's different. That could be a different job than what your uh, you know analyst position might be if, on your I-140. So you know, and that that's uh, a lot of this comes into play with having a good attorney or someone who's knowledgeable enough to help navigate these areas, because there's sometimes, uh, you know, you just, it, certain circumstances make it where it's just not possible to, to maybe port something. Uh, in other circumstances, you know, 
you know, you might want to avoid pitfalls so that you're able to, you know, have these, uh, opportunities taken care of. So, um, you know, there, it's really, a, um, a case by case basis. And, you know, we use this analogy all the time, uh, when we say that, you know, um, everyone's case is much like their fingerprints, right? Uh, no one has shares the same fingerprint with someone else. So we have to always analyze these cases, uh, individually, uh, as unique, uh, jobs as unique uh, positions because if we just do um, you know a rubber stamp or blind uh, processing not really paying attention to what makes this unique uh, that's where you can get into trouble okay look I have a couple of uh, more questions on this I-140 uh, revoke questions let's say one H1 holder a work company A and uh, got I-140 approved com from company A. The later, maybe after one year, he moved to the company B. Mm -hmm. So in technically, the, com the employee is not working company A. So company A, is there any chance to revoke the I-140? Because employee is not existing in his company. So here's the circumstance, right? AC-21 was written and, and modified and has been modified to protect the worker. Uh, when we have H-1B visa holders, we have issues that come up where people are tied and they might feel pressure that they have to stay in a certain role or a certain circumstance and they don't have the freedom to move jobs. This becomes more evident when you get to your fourth, fifth, or sixth year, right? So even if you have the I-140, and you're beyond six years, okay, you might be hesitant to change employers because you're worried if I change and I lose this, I can no longer extend my H-1B visa. So AC-21 was created to say, look, uh, and the last changes were made, I think, three years ago as far as how this goes. They want, to, they want portability to be easier for the H-1B visa holders, not more difficult. So even if the petitioner somehow you know, revokes the I-140, that other I-140, the I-140 that's used can still be used to go beyond the six years. Um, and you can use that. You don't have to have a new I-140 with a new employer. Uh, the only time that's going to come up is when it comes time to file your green card. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to need to have uh, an up-to-date I-140 or someone who's going to sponsor you. But really, a lot of these provisions are created to protect uh, H-1B visa holders. We don't want, uh, you know, for every good uh, employer out there that's, that supports their employees and really takes care of them and wants to make sure everything uh, goes well with them, you know, there might be two people, two employers who have uh, nefarious uh, attitudes towards H-1B visa holders and take advantage of them, you know. So okay. these laws are made to help protect uh, the worker. Okay. But here, just uh, I rephrasing this one because uh, this is a somehow the some gray area. Uh, they're not understanding the process. Let's say if even company A employ employer withdraw the I one forty, does the approved I one forty still exist for the in future beyond the six years? They can use this uh, old I one forty, the previous I one forty for the extension. That is correct, right? Correct. Now, the employer, after six months, the employer shouldn't be able to withdraw uh, or revoke the, the oh, I-140. Yeah, here I understand. There is an option or not? So that is a question. Uh, no. So okay. once you have once you have your fine, uh, uh, people are really knowledgeable about getting their copy, too. So some, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, you might not have I-140 in your hand. There's other ways of getting it, the copy. Um, and, you know, that that's, I'm sure, pretty much common knowledge amongst the uh, H-1B visa holders. Okay. Okay. That's so, so I have some questions on I-485 adjustment, adjustment of status. So the same thing it meant, so uh, let's say, H1, H1B holder applied apply the 485 adjustment of status. He got the EAD and advanced payroll. Hmm. So just I want to know, after 180 days, 
he can can he move to the another company so that's a very good point um the answer the short answer for adjustment purposes would be yes this would be similar to when we filed the i-140 and we're saying we have to have a same or similar position now let's say in my scenario i have a priority date of 2013 i'm currently in eb3 i downgraded eb3 final action date is still 2010 uh, so I'm still multiple years away. So let's say I wait eight months, I get a better opportunity. I want to change from my current employer to a new employer. Well, I can do that and have the freedom and, and knowledge to, and security to know that once I change and it, once my GC final action date becomes current, my new employer can go ahead and sign a supplement J, a, a 45 supplement J, with a job description that's same or similar to what was filed for my uh, initial I-140, and that that would be fine, and, and you know either an RFE will be issued prior to the interview, or you can bring that with you to the interview and give to the officer. And uh, you know, so there's there's pretty much uh, not much more of a requirement other than that. So it's it's a, again, what we want to do is make sure people have the freedom of uh, take care of uh, both of their career and make the best decisions for their families. Uh, and that's what the AC21 provides for that portability. Okay. So on same, I want, I have the additional question. So 485 adjustment. Let's say uh, the recent changes in October with Subalit and most of the H1 holders downgraded to EB2, EB3. So, if any H1 holder apply is downgraded to EB2, EB3 for applying the new I-140, this application, uh, is there any chance employer will revoke this I, this downgraded I-140 application? Well, I mean, it, there's always a chance for anything, to be honest. So, I mean, yes, they could withdraw the petition. Uh, because you know you still have to wait for this to be approved before the six months uh, start. So yeah, if if an employer has downgraded, um, just because you have EAD in your hand or something else, if the I one forty has not been approved and it's not been more than uh, you know six months after the approval, then there might be issues uh, depending on your relationship with your employer. No, it meant the same terms and condition will apply for the. The new I-140. Once approved, I-140, it should be 180 days. Uh, meet to not revoke the new I-140, right? Well, correct. So you're filing concurrently now. The rule states that if your adjustment of status is pending for more than six months, you can port. But let's say it's going to, you know, most people filed uh, I-140s in regular processing. Um, so let's say it takes seven or eight months for I-140 to to be processed. Now, <laughs> if, you're, if your adjustment is still pending for more than six months, but your I-140 is yet to be approved, uh, your employer can always uh, revoke or withdraw it, correct? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have the, another question on uh, 485. Let's say we apply the 485 adjustment of status is still pending. Due to some emergency, I have to have travel to outside of United States. Mm -hmm. The same consequence you you explain for H4, or is there any difference for 485 process? So it's a very good question. Uh, you, you That's what advanced parole is going to help protect, okay? So you do have a certain window uh, processing times here where you you really need to stay in the United States while this is processing because if you travel before you get the advanced parole or EAD document uh, that could be fatal to your pending adjustment of status now um, you know there's certain circumstances that come up and, and emergencies that are that arise uh, but yes you you really need to have those documents in your hand before you uh, depart the United States if you need to. Okay. It means uh, to this safer side, we have to stay until get the EAD and advanced payroll approved. 
Correct. Now, you know, this is also going back to H-1Bs. If we're assuming all these uh, scenarios involve H-1B, an H-1B visa is what we call a dual intent visa. So um, if you did have to travel and you had to get stamped, you know, you're filed already your adjustment of status, which means that you're showing immigrant intent uh, to you want to stay in the United States. Right. Uh, that's OK. But, you know, there's certain circumstances where maybe people from other countries, they're here as a student um, and they go ahead and file, you know, adjustment of status as a F, while they're in F1 status. And even if they have advanced parole um, and employment authorization, it might not be advisable to travel because if there's somehow, you know, advanced parole is is uh, is not a guarantee. It's still discretionary whether or not to let you back in. So if there's any requirement where you would have to get a stamp, uh, you're pretty much violating your non-immigrant status as an F-1 visa holder because now you're saying, hey, I want to stay here. And uh, that would be in conflict with what you agreed to when you received your stamp. So um, there, there's always, like I said, there's always specific scenarios. I know it's very difficult right now. We, we're in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of families have been affected by this pandemic and the need for travel is, you know, has been really uh, significant, you know, as people, as families go through certain hardships. So really we, we don't like people traveling if they don't have to, but we, you know, if you do have an emergency, it's best to consult your attorney, uh, discuss all options and, and possible consequences that could arise if you do depart the United States. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas, for information. Yeah, we discussed a lot of uh, questions today. We touched the all, almost all each segment. Uh, Lucas, we got another question from YouTube from Vishnu Vardhan. He is asking about the 2020, 2022 H1B lottery. Mm. Any updates or prediction about H1B lottery 2022 is going to be random or wage level, wage level lottery? It meant, so well, recently we, we discussed a lot of things. It's going to change everything, right? So is a land out, uh, it, it, will it be random lottery or wage level lottery? So the comment period is closed on that potential uh, rule change. And uh, right now, you know, all the comments are being reviewed. And, and um, you know, hopefully we bought enough time by having enough comments put in place that it flooded the system, so to speak, and delayed a little bit of the process. Uh, it, if this does become a rule, uh, it is going to impact, you know, not only fiscal year 2022, but every year thereafter, unless we change the rule again, uh, where it's instead of, uh, you know, a blind lottery that turns more into, uh, an auction where the highest bidder wins. And I really don't know how practical that can be because, Currently, as the system is set up, there's not a way for us to uh, incorporate LCAs. We cannot incorporate uh, wage uh, to be paid. Uh, it's just basically your passport, date of birth, your name, uh, and the petitioning company. Now, even if you could incorporate an LCA, let's say, let's ask this question: How would that even be fair? If you're a wage level two in the Bay Area under 151132 SOC code, you're at 120 grand a year. If you're here in Dallas under the same SOC code and wage level, you're at 94,000. If you're in Florida under certain uh, in certain places, the, the wage level could decrease down to 75,000. So uh, if you're looking at a position as a merit-based or whatever they want to call it, uh, the opportunity just because the same job can exist in multiple places with multiple different salaries. So I don't know how they're going to incorporate a system to make it fair uh, because not everyone works in California and not everyone works in Texas. Not everyone works, you know, you know, we, this, this program's, uh, you know, for everywhere in the United States. And, and that's what the wage levels and the, uh, the Department of Labor with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that's what all that data is for, is to make sure we have a, uh, an appropriate wage that's a prevailing wage for that position in that location. Okay. 
So is there any, if, if there's no incorporated in new fiscal year 2022, do you think uh, they will select based on the location and uh, code, the wages? Let's say is the Dallas is applied for the 1000, 1000 H1B in the same category, same code, uh, will divide it means so they will choose the based on the um, based on the location and code and choose the maximum uh, it means so maximum LCA. Well, that's of kind of that's kind of what the rule is hinting at. Um, but again, I don't know how they can incorporate um, that in, in into. The current process, the current system we use to the <clears throat> registration system doesn't have any, you know, correlation with uh, Department of Labor or any of these other the flag system or any of these other systems we use to file LCAs, much less determine, uh, you know, there has to be some kind of a sliding scale or, or, or something there if they do implement something like this, because uh, we have to compare apples to apples. It's not it wouldn't be fair. Uh, if you're a wage level three at a certain salary and then a wage level one in a whole different area could be potentially higher than your wage level three salary, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Plus, I think what a lot of people also don't realize is these wage levels uh, don't really have anything to do with the, specifically the individual itself. The wage level is designed by Department of Labor to determine uh, the appropriate wages to pay the for the job that's offered for anyone if it's a u.s uh you know it, whoever might work for, uh, at this job not so much that i have 15 years of experience in doing this this and this so the way it works is we you know pull basic data to see what's the basic entry-level requirement for education usually for h1b's most all these positions uh we we find it's a bachelor's degree okay if we require anything above a bachelor's degree. So if the position requires a master's or a PhD or something like this, we add one point for each education increment that goes above. If the physician requires uh, be, you know, beyond so many years of experience, again, that would be incremental increase in wage. If the physician supervises other people, that would increase the wage level. So that's the way you look at wage levels, and that's the appropriate way of determining what the appropriate wage level is. So I can confidently tell you that if you choose wage level two, I know that if you're uh, the, you know, I can look at it and say, well, we could require it's a master's degree with two years of experience or one year of experience. That would get us to wage level two. If I have a minimum of a bachelor's degree with three years of experience, that would get us to wage level two for you know, something like 151132. Uh, so there's a lot of factors involved, and it's not always just looking at a wage and saying, I make 100K a year, therefore my wage level should be wage level four, right? So there's, there's a whole science to this, uh, or legal analysis to this, that um, it's, it, it's pretty complex. It's not as straightforward as most people might imagine. Okay. I think uh, still we don't have much information about this uh, higher wage uh, wages uh, lottery system. Is we have the short term period, even less than three months, or maybe three months. So I don't think USC is going to implement this new the process. If they want to start new process, they need to enhance the uh, system. Uh, I don't think it in, within this three months will do because. Right. The new admin new administration is taking the January twenty. The by by in this situation, I don't think they won't touch this the new new bill. Maybe eventually they will think about this one, but fiscal twenty twenty two. I once it becomes a rule, it, it is kind of an obligation where they have to follow the rule. Uh, they can't just ignore the rule. But at the same time, like what you 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 also mentioned, um, who who's making the the changes to the software how how is this implementing changes to a database how are we doing that i mean it's a whole complex new structure that they're going to try and implement i don't know how that would would work with what we currently have yeah yes um lucas we will 
we will monitor this uh, new rule and uh, if any updates we will post and facebook page so i think we we 12 minutes fast uh, 7 pm so i think we discuss a lot of lots of information today's show so apart from this do you have any additional information you want to share to our viewers well uh this past uh month or two or three months has been really uh tumultuous as far as changes proposed changes lawsuits uh you know so there, there's still a lot of action that we have in the, the final three weeks uh of the year or two weeks uh and some change but all i can say is that you know um it's been a real positive year uh overall for h1b uh visa holders for the GC process for people who have been, you know, uh, waiting for quite a few years to file uh, the adjustment of status. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can continue this trend and positive uh, results into next year and, and hopefully see some really major changes that impact everyone. And all I can request is that you follow us on our Facebook uh, page, both at uh, Telugu NRI Radio and then also at our op law office page, uh, uh, it's uh, Burgos and Gerritsen Law. And uh, we try to update the community as, as, item, as things change and as uh, news comes out. So, uh, And then, of course, we also have this forum every Wednesday at 6 o'clock uh, with Venkat and myself. So uh, we encourage everyone in the community, you know, please uh, participate because – you might have a situation or, or scenario that impacts you, but there's probably two or three other people with something similar, and it's actually helping them out uh, with your participation because you're you're raising an issue that the, they might not hear while it's live, and you know they might see it on on YouTube or a replay on Facebook, and um, you know so we're really it's a it's a community benefit here, and uh, we try and uh, you know help everyone out and, and do you know be a service to the community yes thank you thank you lucas so thank you everyone who ever participated today and uh, posted question amol venkat uh, venkat chituri and uh, vishnu Vardhan. so we are requesting to you participate every wednesday central time 6 pm you can post your question on facebook page or you can send an email to info at uh, bgimmlr.com or you can send an email to info.telvnrradio at gmail.com. So we will try to provide accurate information as per your scenario, and we will try to give the more information so that you should not panic on your immigration system. This is the, we are trying to simplify USA immigration. Uh, you should, it meant, you don't want to panic on your scenario. Just come. Uh, you can you can post or you can send email uh, to Lucas. So the Lucas is Lu Lucas is ready to help to you to you and the community. We are requesting your participation is very important so that you can get the more information and you can react uh, on scenario. If you have the more information, you can take a better step for should not fall into the complex immigration system. This is we are trying to uh, these sessions on every Wednesday. Uh, today, today's session is in Facebook page and uh, YouTube Telvinara Radio. You can visit later and see the entire the, the one hour 20, one hour 60, maybe one hour 15 minutes video. You can check all questions, all information of today, the show. So we very thankful to Lucas to participating every Wednesday and and uh, providing information to Telugu community. We thankful to you, Lucas. Thank thank you very much. We will continue to the same uh, show for every Wednesday, the Central Time, six p.m. So I'm. I think uh, I'm completed today. We completed the show today. Uh, the signing off from my side, maybe from Lucas. Yep. We will catch next week, maybe next couple of, next two weeks, maybe uh, Christmas Eve. We need to think 
uh, everyone is holiday mode we'll see how does it work or else we will catch up in new year first week 2022 welcome to 2022 thank you lucas thank you very much thank you venka we'll talk to you soon everyone have a, a safe and happy holiday yeah thank you happy holidays Bye. thank you very much